We got up, of course, before uh, before dawn, uh, getting our to get prepared. And as dawn started to break, we could see the island, just see the image of the island out in front of us. Iwo looked like an island that had been fortified heavily. I had my 19th birthday on Iwo Jima. You don't understand all the things about life at the, when you're that young yet, but you learn fast. I was scared. Damn right I was scared. And at my age, I just considered myself being invincible. As originally they had told us it, it was only going to be a 72-hour operation. It, it's a traumatic feeling uh, on a, a landing craft going into a beach that's uh, occupied by the enemy. Uh, one of the saddest things was even before we left the ship, uh, to go ashore, they was already bringing casualties on, and that is, that is very disheartening. We had constant stream of boats going back and forth with wounded from the beach into the various hospital ships and the APAs that were out there taking care of them. There's a tremendous number of wounded with that outfit. We landed with 257 in F Company. After 36 days, there was 27 of us left. The rest were casualties. When I came back on the same line, they were still there. But they were no longer alive. All of us who lived feel guilty. Excuse me. That was probably the, the highlight of my life. That's something I'll never forget. Yeah. You know, as a young man, I, was, I never seen nothing like this, you know. The cost for Iwo Jima was tremendous. There's no two ways about it, but it also shortened the war. And for the past 60 years, there isn't a day goes by that I don't think about it. I think this country is wonderful. Wow. I can't say enough. Freedom is expensive. And when you look at lives, you have to agree. While we're having our coffee and donuts, uh, the ship's radio was picking up Tokyo Rose's broadcasts. And I'll never forget her words. Welcome, men of the 5th Marine Division to Iwo Jima. When we left Guam, we had no idea where we were going. Iwo Jima was a new name for us. We didn't find out that we were going to Iwo Jima until we left Saipan. They never tell you anything about it until you're aboard ship and at sea. We didn't know why we were going to Iwo Jima. We never heard of it. I never even knew it, it existed until I was there. It looked like a, an island out of this world. It looked like something from another, from space or something, because there was no vegetation or anything on it. What little there was, the Navy blew off of it, so. Now, the island of Iwo Jima, I, I always refer to it as a piece of dirt, and that's what it was, a piece of dirt. It was shaped like a pork chop, an aerial view, and of course there was this infamous Mount Suribachi. Suribachi dominates the island, dominates 
your, your view of the Lee Island, and no doubt we expected that the Japanese headquarters would be in it. Well, the day before, we got the pictures of what the beach looked like and the new positions that had been discovered from the latest bombing run. And then we found out that uh, the Air Force had been bombing Iwo Jima for 72 days. They had a lot of people underground, and there was they were just not susceptible to heavy bombing. All I knew was there were about 20,000 Japanese there. That, uh, and we had trouble trying to figure out how we were going to get up Mount Suribachi. Iwo looked like an island that had been fortified heavily. But the reality of it is that it was a fortress that looked like an island. Because from one end to the other, you didn't have, the map will show you, lines of the enemy defenses, but that isn't the reality. It was defense in depth. You never broke through and then they collapsed. That did not happen. Kurbiashi, as we understood it, had told his men, you take care you take ten Americans for every one Japanese and we can be successful. Initially we didn't feel as though it was going to be that bad. But the fact that the island was really a flame and the smoke uh, didn't feel as though it was going to be too difficult. I said, so it can't be much. It's a small island, only eight square miles. What kind of problem can there be in a small island like that? And there are only 5,000 Japanese soldiers there. Well, we found out that there were 22 or 23,000 Japanese soldiers. When we did hit it, they thought we could have taken in 72 hours. That was the general consensus. We were told that <clears throat> the whole operation would take about three to five days. And we've been led to believe that because of the tremendous uh, pre-invasion naval bombardment and the uh, bombardment by the uh, uh, United States Air Corps, that there'd be few, if any, Japanese left on the island, and those who may be left would be so shell-shocked, so to speak, that they would not be able to resist us. And we really believed it when they said it would be a three to five day operation. Originally the Navy was going to shell the island for ten days and they cut it down to three days which caused a lot of problems. But the Air Force bombed Iwo Jima for 72 consecutive days and it did absolutely no, it had no effect whatsoever. Everything was underground. Every aspect of that island's terrain was exploited in the most feasible way of inflicting damage on us. Yeah, they pretty much thought that it was going to be an easy operation. They didn't realize how badly, I guess, the, the Japanese were dug in. Because originally they had told us it was only going to be a 72-hour operation, but there was a lot they didn't know about the Japanese who were completely underground. I had my 19th birthday on Iwo Jima. And uh, in, on March the 21st, and we got off the island on March the 26th. Uh, my 19th birthday was uh, spent aboard ship, and I knew I celebrated my 21st birthday on the island of Iwo Jima. 18 years was the average age at Iwo, meaning more men were 18 than were not. You don't understand all the things about life at the, when you're that young yet, but you learn fast. And my men said to me, Lieutenant, you promised that we would be going like kids, you know, and they were, they are 18 years old, but they became men very quickly. And at my age, I just considered myself being invincible. I don't think you ever think you're going to die. I don't think anybody ever felt they were going to get hit. I mean, we all thought that we were, uh, uh, you know, uh, safe, that we were going to be safe and so forth. I had made two previous D-Day landings and I knew what was coming up. Uh, I guess at that age, you're a little bit uh, uh, invincible, you feel like. Well, the night before we landed, uh, we, we were on LSTs. We traveled on LSTs all over the Pacific. Uh, we had come from Guam. It took uh, oh, about three days, I think it was, from Guam to get to Iwo. And uh, the whole convoy rendezvoused during the night off of Iwo. We just 
listening and watching the bombardment of the uh, of the island and um, just wondering what was in there and what we was going to get into. The thinking was really how do how we, how were you going to survive this? This is my first battle. I'm an optimistic soul, and I but I heard people walking the decks, and uh, it occurred to me the old timers know what's ahead. I don't. You don't very well do, do much sleeping the night before you, because you're you're thinking about it. You never know whether you're uh, you come back or not. So, but you just you just hope you do. But you really don't think of what's going to happen to you, okay? Because you're too involved in the task that's in front of you. Most of the fellows were. Uh... Uh, accepted what was about to happen. I was scared. Damn right I was scared. Oh, absolutely. Everybody was scared, but uh, they also knew they had to do something, and uh, you don't let your buddies down. I had no idea, and I wasn't prepared for what I was going to face on the island. Everybody is pretty much their own thoughts, uh, trying to think of what's going to happen, what they're going to do. I think to describe most of all, it was quiet. I think each man was lost in his own thoughts uh, about what's going to happen when we hit that beach. Uh, am I going to make it? Am I going to come out of this battle alive? And I looked around and I wondered, who is going to be here tomorrow night? I would say the morale was very high. Nobody came wavering or indicating any, indicating any serious uh, fear. They had respect for and the sense of obligated duty to God, to country, of being a great Marine. To the imminent danger that death is very uncertain. It can happen to the young and to the old. We know not the day nor the hour. As we are ready as Marines, we are to be ready as soldiers of Jesus Christ. I had mass up on the forecastle, and there was they were crowded all over. Up there's a picture there of the troop ship. They were up on the gun mounts and so on and so forth. So I gave a talk, which just came naturally, I guess. I said, now men, this is at the end of Mass, you have nothing to worry about, nothing to be afraid. Today you received Holy Communion at this Mass. When we hit that beach, God will be with you and you have nothing to be afraid of. For the Marines, every man for himself and God for us all. And so that means, hey, uh, trust in God that you come back alive. I believe it was the skipper's voice, the Navy skipper's voice, came over and said, halt, or words to that effect. He says, we're going to have a prayer by the chaplain. And the chaplain recited the 23rd Psalm. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death. And uh, once again, th those words uh, sent a chill up our spine. When the prayer was over, then down the cargo net and into the landing craft. We got up, of course, before, uh, before dawn, uh, getting our to get prepared, and uh, we had a very early breakfast, which was a joy because we never had steak and eggs uh, before. We had our final meal of, of steak and eggs, and that's rather traditional in Marine Corps. They had us up about four in the morning. They fed us steak for breakfast. We slipped a few sandwiches in our pockets to take in with us. We went down to Chow, and uh, the amphibian tractors were all in the, the hold there. And as dawn started to break, we could see the island, just see the image of the island out in front of us. And uh, as it got lighter, the uh, Navy fighter planes and bombers started coming in, making their runs. And then as the sun came up, then looming out in the uh, water was uh, our target, Iwo. And uh, it was just, all smoke, all ablaze, and we could see the, uh, uh, the, uh, the hour bombers taking their runs, and you could see the explosions of their, of their bombs. 
and of course the Navy ships, uh, the gun ships uh, offshore, why they were also laying down their last barrage, I guess you could call it. Anyway, after breakfast, we we got uh, all our gear together and went topside, waiting for the order to go down the uh, climb down the uh, cargo nets. We had nets that were aboard ship that would climb down nets into the landing craft, which would take us on into the beach. It's kind of a sickening feeling as you get up there and put your hand on the edge of the net, the cargo net that we had to go down to get into some of the boats. One of the thrills of your lifetime is going down a cargo net to get into a landing craft with a uh, pack on your back and a medical accessory bag on the side of that. And yes, and the boats, the Higgins boat's going up and down like this and the ship is going like this and you gotta coordinate going down that rope that you don't get caught between the ship and the Higgins boat. Several people fell. I mean, it wasn't unusual to see people fall, and fall into, the, into the boat. And the boat's down there going like, going like this, and everything else is... Once you're down the ladder and into the boats, they float in formation until they get the go. And when they get the go, they elongate into a single file abreast and go. Each landing craft heads to what we call rendezvous point. And as each landing craft gets to uh, rendezvous point, it becomes an uh, ever-widening circle. Well, in Higgins' boat, first you go to a, an assembly area called the line of departure, or just behind it, and you go in a circle with the boats that are going in, which are usually five or six at a time. And then when the command comes uh, for you or for anybody else, you go line up at the line of departure, and then you drop a flag that you can see, and off we go. We had just had our eyes peeled on that, uh, got, uh, that small boat out there that had flags on it, and we knew what, the, what our flag was, and as soon as they ran our flag up and dropped it, that means go. And as more landing craft join, the wider the circle gets. And then the word comes from the command ship to head for the beach, and what was now a, what was a circle now becomes a wave as it just stretches out. And now you've got wave after wave after wave. So when we went to the island, we had that feeling, piece of cake, that was all we were talking about. And we went in, we went in under the guns of the battleships. We could feel the heat of the guns over our heads as we went in. And as we got to very close to the islands, actually. We were near Suribachi, not too far. We were on the green beach. Suribachi was on the green beach and uh, we got closer and closer and... And all of a sudden we all straight, all the boats straightened out and they all headed at one time toward the beach. Nobody much talked to anybody. Pretty much everybody, we just had their own thoughts going in. We'd done it before, figured it was much the same. Very quiet. I mean, very quiet. Everybody was thinking what, what was going to happen. It's, it's pretty quiet. Nobody's saying much. Uh, the uh, sergeant uh, of the platoon is uh, kind of guiding us a little bit and, and, and telling us when we hit the beach and what to do to keep down and so forth. Get to shore, get the hell off of that boat and, and, and move, you know. And because you got, you got your platoon sergeant telling you, you know, hey, this is it, you know, we're going. We have to be ready because we're going into combat. And when you go under fire, I don't care what they say, you have butterflies in your stomach and you're nervous. The Japanese knew we were coming and they were ready and they got prepared. The minute we passed the line of departure and the ramp went down, uh, the sunshine was gone. Uh, it was, you were under a cloud of smoke. It, it's a traumatic feeling uh, on a, a landing craft going into a beach. It's, uh, occupied by the enemy. I mean, the closer we got, and finally the naval bombardment stopped because our first wave was ready to hit, you know. And uh, as we got closer to the beach, uh, of course, an enemy fire was coming in on us and hitting some of the landing craft. But when you see a, a boat with probably uh, maybe 25 or 30 Marines in her take a direct hit, you know, and you know, that, that makes you think, you know, th this is for real, you know. You're told to lock and load your piece and, and then you get 
down this time you hunker down and they drop the ramp and away you go no we just hit the beach and the ramp dro dropped down and just try and go when he strikes the sand for the first time down goes the ramp and off we go and we went ashore and he dropped the front of it and he said get out and as we hit the beach and one of the main sayings we had is clear the beach get off the beach opened the ramp, we went out in four or five feet of water. So uh, that's no way to fight a war soaking wet. Our LCVP could not get into the shore, and we had to drop the ramp and get out. We were in water up to about my chest, hold our rifles up above us and get to the beach the best way we could. And uh, when we hit that beach, we, we knew we were in trouble. It wasn't until we hit shore that it uh, finally dawned us what we were, uh, what we were getting into. As we sailed in to, uh, to the shore. I happened to be in the second wave to go in. And uh, it was somewhat of a, uh, well, maybe today you might refer to it as a traumatic, traumatic experience to find what was waiting for us on the beach. The beach master's job was to make sure, or to try to make sure to keep the beach clear so that they wouldn't just have boats wrecked all over the beach and, and, uh, and the ships that you needed to get in couldn't get in. It was very quiet uh, when we hit the beach. Uh, not entirely quiet, there was sporadic uh, gunfire. They allowed us to land uh, without much uh, fire to start with. But uh, this uh, Japanese general, Kuribayashi, uh, his plan was to leave the first five waves in and get the beach as congested as possible and then open up with all of his mortar and artillery. And as it turned out, wave after wave coming in, the third and fourth waves uh, were catching up with the first and second waves. And, it, and this is what the, the Japanese wanted. They, they wanted it to get it all congested there and then open up with their artillery and their mortar. One Navy individual who's known as the beach master he rides parallel to the shore, saying what's happening. And with his bullhorn, he was, he was yelling, get the hell off the beach. When we came ashore, there's a rise of about 30, 35 feet. And it's all volcanic ash. The beach was not sand, it was volcanic ash. And actually to walk on the volcanic ash, you sank up, up to your ankles. It was just like walking in snow. The uh, black sand of the beach was a stark contrast to any sand I'd ever seen before. Uh, it was a very loose sand so that you sunk into it uh, uh, as you would walk along. So that meant it was hard to advance or to advance uh, quickly. There were a series of three terraces from the beach up to the first airfield. And uh, it was all volcanic ash and, and it was so Thin that the, the amphibs just sunk in it. As we left the landing craft, we advanced a few yards and then there was a, what can best be described as a terrace, all right? We call it the first terrace. And after you went up this first terrace, there was a, a plateau for several yards and then there was another terrace. The beach was covered with men. I mean, lying in up against the, it's a terrace. Uh, landing area. The beach was terraced up this this way. And the first, the first uh, uh, wave got in, and they started up, and they got up a little bit, and they let them go. And we thought, well, you know, this isn't going to be bad at all. So we got in, and as we got up toward the top, that's when all the the firing and everything broke loose. It, it's very difficult to describe because it just came in one huge barrage and. Every gun that they had on the island opened up against us. And then the salvo started coming down and the beach just jumped. That's what surprised us. We were going in, we saw all these shells hitting on the beach. We were saying, where's that coming from? It was the Japanese firing at the beaches. Every foot was zeroed in with either rifles or mortars. The mortars started landing from Surabachi because they were prepared, like I said earlier, and they knew the exact distances they needed 
to drop those motors uh, into where we, where we were. The first wave has gone in, letting mortar fires come again, for sure on Iwo Jima, quite heavily, and going up and down the beach. Everybody was pinned down. Uh, the movement, and that's what they were screaming and hollering, get off the beach, get off the beach, move inland, you know. We saw what was happening on the beach. The type of fire coming from the Japanese was unbelievable. We were catching artillery and mortar fire from both sides, from, from the volcano on the, on the south and from the hills that we hadn't even gotten into yet up in the north. You didn't know where the, you didn't know where the fire was coming from because their pillboxes and their blockhouses were so camouflaged and, and dug in the ground. And of course the whole island from one end to the other was nothing but tunnels. They were raking the beach, they would go up. <laughs> they would hit and hit just keep pounding the beach and then they would come back down the other way and so you just kept thinking I hope this one doesn't hit our hole. The, uh, the Japs were dug in on Mount Suribachi looking down our throats in fact they blew quite a few ships out of the water before the troops even got to the beach because of the way they were zeroed in along the beach and the surrounding beach areas. See, They're looking right down your neck you couldn't, you couldn't dig deep enough to get out. Even if you could dig down in that sand, they, could, they were still looking right at you. As we were going back for our equipment, uh, stretchers were coming, coming down the sand ash dune uh, with the early wounded already. So it was pretty much a nightmare as to what was hap happening. The first one I went to was beyond my help. Uh, one arm was gone and a good part of the shoulder with it and he had a very severe head wound. But not dead at the time I got to him, but he died within minutes. And that was my first uh, case at Iwo Jima. There'd be a guy there, and the next instant they just disappear. You go see him out, picking up an arm and a leg, a dog tag, and throw him anything, some pieces of dog tag, and put on a poncho. I'd never seen anything like that. I'd seen a lot that were killed with rifle fire but I never seen anyone that was hit by a mortar. This one poor guy, I don't know who that he was, he got in this hole, you know? They blew this landing barge up. It must have went a mile in here. Don't you think the heaviest part of the barge came down and killed him in the hole? What are the odds on that? When I came across about three or four men that were uh, in flames, and as I went from man to man, they were dying, but they were still conscious. And I had anointed each one. It was very hard to find a place where I could anoint because of the fire. The, their bodies were so tortured. The first person I saw was one of, the, one of my buddies from my company. And well, what his whole insides were just blown, and a couple of minutes later, either a corpsman or a doctor came up to look at him, and then he just covered him up. So I, I, I knew I knew he was gone. But that poor, that poor kid didn't know what, what hit him. And the whole side of his head, like this, was just gone. And there was just a vacant spot up inside there. And you could actually look through his skull, through his eye, and see the light. I've seen guys with their guts in their hands. And, uh, <sighs> <laughs> the 
they, they started to scream because what was happening, we were sinking. The hole in the bottom of this tank or the several holes or whatever, the salt water was getting in and it was getting into their wounds. There was, you know, bodies strewn all over the beach there. A few of the men that were in my platoon there that I went through boot camp with, I lost them right there on the beach. And there's no, there was no place that was really safe. The sight that I witnessed, uh, it's the first time I've seen death and smelled the death. Nobody can imagine We were held up for a while, and his body was uh, was next to our our foxhole, and uh, it bothered me. He'd been hit in the eye, and he laid there for a couple of days. They didn't get him out. Other than seeing my buddy with the front of his head blown off, <sighs> it's just the amount of casualties. It's it's just they were all over the place. I mean, it just. <sighs> Joe Saguero, nicest guy from Puerto Rico. He never went on the operation. He always used to stay back at Maui. But he wanted to go on this one because he figured a war might soon be over. So he's walking around and he goes, how you doing, Joe? We went to a boot camp together. And he took one right in the head. Poor Joe. After laying there for quite a while, I got up and walked up the beach. And what do I find but a Navy corpsman laying there, his right arm missing. I gave him a shot of morphine. And we were told when you do that, to mark it on their forehead that, that you gave them a shot of morphine, I think. I anointed each one, and as I'd go from one to the other, I could hear something that I didn't hear too much of in civilian life. As I'd leave the first one and tending to the second one, the first one would be in a dying voice, thank you, Father. The same thing happened with the second man when I went to the third. It's a memory that I'll never forget. Each one dies differently. Some die in, in almost uh, a convulsive state. Others, you'll be working on them and they'll just pass away and you're not even aware of it at the time. And I was kneeling down in front of him and I said, Chief, you better get down. He was from Oklahoma and Chambliss was his name. And just a super part Indian kid, just a super sergeant. And I said, Chambliss, you better get down. Well, he didn't and C Captain Smith was right there with me. This bullet came in the back of his pack, hit a spoon and blew his spoon right through his chest and I still have I got blood and lungs all over my face and hands all over this stuff and I still have the little book that I have with some of his blood still in it. I saw a friend of mine named of Wheel. Oh Wheel. There you are. So I walked over he had kind of a nice watch on. I thought I'll take that watch off and send it to his family. So I loosened the band took it off had to tug a little bit when it came off. A slice of him came off with it. Quite often you will hear the wounded, especially those who are very severely wounded, say mother, mother, they're, they're, or mama. And that, that's very sad. But again, uh, you don't let it bother you. You just keep on going. Do the best you can. Something hit him in the area of his base of his spine and just went right up his back and laid him open just he was just laying there in two halves when i came back on the same line they were still there but they were no longer alive it was hectic you know we had mortar fire plopping all around us just plopping in the water and there were corpses uh laying in the water just laying there marines with their heads down and up and all kinds of ways and i saw one young fella that was laying down with his leg up in the air and a bomb landed beside him and took all the flesh off his leg and he died holding that leg. 
Sergeant Livingston and his squad were ahead of us, and uh, somebody hollered, Livingston's hit. Well, he was shot right through the throat and killed him right there. But in one swoop, they just took the tops of their head. They just, their heads looked almost like, <laughs> like two soup bowls. They were completely beheaded, scalped. Well, you saw the dead Marines all over the place. It was, it was a horrible sight. Just dead Marines, wounded Marines. Chaos. The worst part of the duty I had was picking up dead bodies. And the sun was extremely hot. And what happens is the fluid in the body under the skin starts to shake like jello. And this really upset me. Nobody can imagine Nobody can imagine the odor of decayed flesh. You cannot imagine that. To give you an idea of casualties, some platoons were down to seven men. The lieutenant would get knocked off, the platoon sergeant was knocked off, the, this, the uh, buck sergeant was knocked off, and it came down to a corporal. And in some cases, a senior PFC took care of the seven men left until uh, replacements came in. And you saw these replacements coming in, they were fresh, looked like they were fresh out of boot camp. Kids had just learned how to shave. It really uh, pulled your heart. The men that I witnessed in the thick of battle, they seemed to have complete trust in the mercy of God, in the goodness of God, and that they were ready any time to meet God. They were so appreciative. None of them, uh, there was no tears. They died as they lived. Strong. Adhering. I came across the Marine who Obviously, he'd been treated by a corpsman before I came to him. His chest had been blown open. He had head wounds also. He was conscious, and uh, he is speaking rather feebly to me. And uh, he asked me to go into his pack, and very gently I was able to roll him a little on the side to where I was able to open his pack. And uh, inside of his pack was a a photograph, uh, probably an 8 by 10, it was a rather large photograph of a woman with an infant in her arms. And uh, I'm assuming it was his wife and child. And the photograph, just like his uniform and his pack, had been pierced by shrapnel. And uh, he wanted it. And uh, I took it from his pack and put it in his hands. and. Uh, he looked at it and uh, smiled very weakly, and that was it. He just passed away. In this land of the walking wounded, in this desert of countless sorrows, I will cling to his hand today and fear not for tomorrow. In my heart I have made this promise And with this song I declare my choice I will walk where the shepherd leads And heed no other voice In the chill of my darkest hour Saved from my deep despair For the Father who loves His children Hears my trusting In my 
my soul there is one light shining from the flame of my true belief and its embers cannot be quenched or robbed by any thief in the end we are not forgotten and our journey is not in vain for the master who brought us here will lead us home lead us home again I was right up above the cliff up there, and we started to move in when we first saw our first Japanese. And uh, we let him get about halfway to us, so he was only about 150 yards from us, and here come about three more of them. And we opened fire on them and got them all right there, just bam! Occasionally, if you'd see a Japanese, and you fire, and they'd go down, you knew you hit them, but when you get up there, they're gone. Now they were bringing them all back into their caves. And the Japanese would come out of their caves and then go back into their caves, no matter how much we fired at them. The Japanese had all their pillboxes and blockhouses all uh, covering one another. So if you knocked one out, uh, other ones could cover it. I mean, it wasn't a case of knocking one out and going through. Uh-uh, it didn't work that way. My particular job, I had half the squad most of the time and we were called in to blast caves, mainly caves, and pillboxes. And we tried to burn them out, but we'd lay down a stream of fire into the openings of the bunker to keep that machine gun from spraying us. And then, as I said, the pole charge guys would go in and then the flamethrowers. We had flamethrowers we could carry on our back, some of our some of the boys carried a flamethrower on their back and they would shoot the, they would fire at the cave entrances. As we took ground, the engineers would follow us up and blow the cave entrances shut so they couldn't come up behind us. Part of the 5th Marine Division climbed, uh, the 28th Regiment climbed Mount Suribachi and uh, that's where uh, Joe Rosenthal's and um, a couple of the other photographers were up there when the flag was raised, you know. The 28th was just a great outfit, commanded by a great colonel by the name of Harry, Colonel Harry Libesedge. I'm still a close friend of Dave Severance, Colonel Severance, who was the commanding officer of Easy Company, the company that put the flag up on Suribachi. E Company went up Suribachi first and raised the flag, and we relieved E Company that same day. So the colonel then got a 42-man team and get, had them line up and uh, was giving them instructions and turns to me, Wells, how, where's the flag? So I got the flag and handed it to him. And, um, and he told them, if, if you get to the top, and I'd like to have you put this flag up. Good luck. I was standing watch, it happened, uh, up in the conning tower, and uh, I... Uh, wasn't aware of the flag going up. I had no idea it was going to go up or anything about it. When uh, I heard from down below on the deck, our deck officer, uh, Ted Hollander, he yelled up to me. He said, Bill, they just put the flag up on Suribachi. And I, I said, like, you're kidding, because that had been a thorn in our side, you know. And I looked over on Suribachi, and sure enough, there was the American flag. I watched the flag go up. I saw these guys go up the side of Manso Bachi, as I'm watching him go up, I suddenly saw the flag come up. I was at the base, on the beach, at the base looking up at it. And when they holler colors and you spin and you see it going up, <laughs> get goosebumps. So I hopped over to the edge and looked, and all of a sudden, there, there was old glory standing float flying up there on Mount Suribachi. Boy, what a beautiful sight that was. And I happened to look up and I, I saw it. We saw the flag go up that day. And man, that's a feeling you never forget. One of the guys turned around to me and said, look. And we looked up and we saw the flag it was just going up. 
And then a tremendous cheer across the island. And when the flag did was raised, the first flag, uh, just like it was just like the uh, Fourth of July, New Year's Eve in Times Square. All the boats blew their whistles. It was the same reaction when you're at a football guy, a football game, and a guy makes a touchdown. When you looked up and saw that flag, you raised all kind of hell. You clapped and cheered and everything else, like you were really rooting for it, you know. In this day and time, if if we had known how to high five, we'd have high fived. It really brings, brought tears to your eyes, because a lot of guys were killed going up there to get it up, and there was honking of horns and everything from all the ships that were there once once it went up. We all felt a feeling of pride and a feeling of security was coming because we had taken the high ground. Rosenthal's picture of the flag raising was the second flag raising. The first one that went up was a small flag and then he sent up a larger one. And there were six flag raisers. Of the six, three of them were killed in action. They wanted all six of them off the island and brought back because they kind of felt they were national heroes once that picture uh, Hit the, hit the news, you know. When uh, the photographer got up to the top of the mountain, uh, they were just raising the flag just then, and without even thinking, he grabbed his camera, took a picture of it, and then without thinking, he didn't ask the names of the fellows who were the uh, flag raiser. There's six, uh, six men. We did not know on February the 23rd that the flag was raised and they secured Mount Suribachi, uh, the Marines did, and that famous picture was taken by a photographer called Joe Rosenthal, who was a civilian, and he worked for a New York newspaper. He recalls, he says he was, fa he was facing opposite the uh, flag raising, and he just turned around and hit the picture just like that. He got a great shot. That picture went around the world. You gotta depend on your buddy, your buddy depends on you, and you never forget that fact. One element of that survival involves the attitude of your buddy. You may not know it, but he's looking out for you too. And we did look out for each other. It's a brotherhood that's unequaled or unparalleled by anybody ex except those who go under fire. Everybody looks out for you. You take care of your buddy, or if it's not your buddy, it doesn't matter who it is, and everybody's trying to protect yourself. And, and uh, there's a brotherhood that becomes instant. And that was one of the nice things about the Marines. <clears throat> they, they stick together. That's why you have somebody who will throw himself on a grenade without thinking. It's on impulse. He throws himself on a grenade and he's killed to save his buddies. It's just a, an impulse. The respect they had for each other. One man that I saw actually give up his life, he ran out into the open because his buddy was shot and killed. And I reached down and I put my arms around him. I said, I've got my arms around you like I had then. And tears came into my eyes and tears came into his. and. But that was camaraderie. The Marines are a very proud group, and Marines always look out for one another. And so we have a real camaraderie and support of one another and pride. You, you're, you're proud, and you, you've been trained. You're going to go through and do this thing. But because of the training and the things that you go through and the lessons you learn, you learn how to fight. And that's the Marine tradition. We know how to fight because the only thing we understand is to win because when you're under fire boy you want to live you don't want to die everybody wants to live but as a marine we know we're trained to fight 
we know how to fight, and they leave us alone, we'll get the job done. And you cannot win a war in defense. You have to win it through aggression, and you have to know what you're doing. And I thankfully that I feel proud to be a Marine. I guess you can feel that. I mean, to this day, I mean, we're, we're like brothers. It's, it just doesn't change. They were closer than brothers. They were closer than family because you ate with them, you fought with them, you lived in a hole with them. Actually, the guys that you were in service with, you were closer to them than any member of your family. Because you ate with them, you slept with them, you knew more about them, you knew more about them than their mothers and fathers knew. Because they, 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 they confessed everything to you, because they trusted you. They put their life on the line to, uh, to save me. And uh, it's something that's ingrained in you. You depend on them, they depend on you. Uh, you never leave them behind. Without question, I have the greatest respect and reverence for the discipline of the U.S. Marine Corps. They have a standard of loyalty, fidelity, courage that vibrates. They made a man out of me, yes. They made me respect reality. There's no training like Marine Corps training, and it's not because I was there, it's, it's just a known fact. Never regretted a day of being in the Marine Corps. I still don't. Makes a man of you. I don't know how to put it. I, I don't want to say I'm an ex-Marine or a former Marine. I'm still a Marine. True and true. True and true, you know. Well, Iwo Jima, to me, served a very good purpose for the number of aviators that were saved that were able to land on Iwo Jima after making their bombing runs up in Japan. Iwo Jima had, of course, fighter planes there and radar, and they would uh, notify the uh, home island of the B-29s that were approaching. The zeros on Iwo would come up, intercept, shoot the B-29s, They'd be shot at again when they got to Japan. They had to come back near Iwo. They'd be shot at again. So they were losing a lot of B-29. They needed the island because they were going to bomb Japan, and they uh, needed a place for the B-29s to that got hit to come back in and land in emergency cases. Our crew would have been down three times, and we're just one of over a thousand crews. So I don't know how many others have been saved because of that. Uh, I know there was a lot of lives lost doing that, but there were a lot of lives saved too. It's my understanding some 22,000 Air Corps lives were saved because they were able to make emergency landings at Iwo Jima. Well, I really feel that Iwo Jima was a big step toward the ending of the war. And it's quite possible if we didn't, if we hadn't taken Iwo, that the two planes, two B-29s carrying the atomic weapons could have been intercepted too. So in a way it led to uh, the end of the war. I saw the very first crippled B-29 that landed on Iwo Jima. While the fighting was going on on Iwo Jima, a B-29 landed on one of the airstrips. I was standing at, uh, on the airport, I think the airport number two. And I say, what the hell is this? This plane is coming in. And I'm standing there with an officer. I say, I say gee, that's a B-29. He says, we don't have B-29. I says, gunner? He, he was a Marine gunner. I said, that's a B-29. And that landed. 
I don't know how it got over Mount Suribachi, but it did. Now, we landed there on the 19th of uh, February, and the first B-29, while the fighting was going on, landed March the 4th. We seen a B-29 coming in low and making a circle out there, and which was the landing pattern. And I, I says, he's coming in. I remember the first B-29 that landed coming back from Tokyo. It had, a, had an engine out. And he came in on his belly, came belly landed and swiveled and went up against one of the dunes and did not catch a fire and saved that crew. So 7,000 Marines and corpsmen die, so that 22,000 air corpsmen may live. That's a pretty good trade-off, all for freedom. The thing that I think most all Marines feel are the heroes died on that island and it was really tough. The guys who didn't come back were the real heroes. But there were some great men who did unbelievable things in the war to keep it going. You know, officers, great officers, great men. Where do we get these men from? Where do they come from? And to think that, that there was that many of young men would give up their life for the protection of their families at home. It's, they were just a different kind of person. And I think of all those men that, that died that were there. The crosses, the Star of Davids. The way they did that is they took a bulldozer and they gouged a long trench with the bulldozer. And then men went in and they made little slots in the bottom of the trench. And then they laid the men in, they wrapped them in ponchos and laid them in the holes. And, and the worst part was three bulldozers, three abreast, manned by the Seabees, and there were hundreds of bodies on the beach, and they were plowing them over and making a common grave. I guess the thing that touched me most was seeing the cemetery. bothers me today. See the names. It brought us back off the front and uh, back about three or four hundred yards and we were very close to where they were uh, putting the uh, fourth division cemetery and uh, they just had rows and rows of Marines laying there uh, uh, being ready to be identified and, and prepared for uh, the burial. And uh, just to look at all those guys laying there, it, uh, it, it's something I never forgot. If you enjoy the life you're living and the way you, the way, the conditions, the way they are, then somewhere you have to thank a veteran. A veteran's been involved in your life somewhere along the line. You just have to reflect and think what we have and why we have it and who helped provide it. But America is the greatest country in the world and has done more for people, I think, than any other country. I think this country is wonderful. Well, I can't say enough. I get the goosebumps whenever I hear the national anthem sung. I love my country and that's a reaction. I'm very emotional about patriotism. Freedom is probably the most wonderful thing that we can even comprehend. Freedom, to be free. There's a part of my dedication to my life and for you and so forth that I believe freedom to be the great thing. To just to be free is worth dying. Well, there is a price to pay, 
and uh, it took a lot of lives. That there's always a price. Nobody can put a monetary price on freedom. If you're called to duty in an emergency, you better be obliged. You've got to work for it. You've got to be willing to fight for it and give up your life if you have to for your family and for your buddies and for your friends and your country. This is the best country in the world. Freedom is expensive. And when you look at lives, you have to agree. Too expensive, it seems, at times. You pay an awful price for it. That means everything to me, freedom. Something that we fought for. It means a lot. And when I hear the Star Spangled Banner, I get emotional. And when I see somebody burn it or have it on the seat of his pants, I get very angry. And I see athletes and I see people in high positions, political people, when the flag goes by, they don't even pay any attention to it. That hurts me, that they can't appreciate what the lives of the men and the sacrifices that they have given their eyesight and their limbs and their hearts and they've given their everything they could do, their lives, if they called for it. And to see people not appreciate that. But freedom is going to cost you blood, it's going to cost lives. But as a Marine, I'm still dedicated that if I was called upon it, I could still do a darn good job. And I would be proud to be there supporting what's going on in the world today, that people know what freedom and the feelings of freedom are. I would say nothing comes free. Nothing comes for free. And you got to defend and fight for what you hold dearest to you. Because if you don't, there's going to be some faction that's trying to take it away from you. I hope it will always remain as a beacon of light to the citizenry of our great country and to fulfill the obligations of serving America, to defend it at all costs. Otherwise, the heroes and the deceased of World War II will have been in vain. So here's a, it's a trade-off. Some lose for others to live. And that is freedom. We landed with 257 in F Company. After 36 days, there was 27 of us left. The rest were casualties. Iwo Jima had to be taken. There was a tremendous loss of life there, as you know. Over 25,000 wounded, 7,000 dead. But it had to be taken at any cost. The cost was high. What it meant to me today, I meant that I, sac I almost sacrificed my life for something that I believed in. The cost for Iwo Jima was tremendous. There's no two ways about it, but it also shortened the war. I grew up on Iwo Jima. Uh, that was a turning point in my life. That was probably the, the highlight of my life. That's something I'll never forget. Yeah. You know, a young man, I, was, I never seen nothing like this. You know. To this day, you can't forget it. It was too big a part of a person's life to be forgotten. I think uh, it'll always be on your mind. Something you're never going to forget. Sometimes I think about it. Sometimes I don't think about it at all. All of us who lived feel guilty. Excuse me. That's something that's, you don't forget, that everybody should know what it's all about. We must never, never forget. Well, it's rather obvious that it's brought back a lot of memories. 60 years, and I get emotional. And for the past 60 years, there isn't a day goes by that I don't think about it. 
It was your job and uh, it, ha it had to be done and uh, you were there to do it. I feel proud that I have experienced what I had and beauty part, like I'm saying, I'm still here to talk about it. Well, I really don't have to tell you how terribly proud I am that, uh, that I can say I'm an Iwo Jima veteran, that I was there, uh, that I did the job I was trained for. I did it to the very best of my ability. We did what we had to do. We had an assignment. We fulfilled it, period. It's over. It's sad. <laughs> but it's over. When you walk through the storm Hold your head up high And don't, don't be afraid of the dark At the end of the storm There's a golden sky and the sweet silver song of a lark. Walk on through the wind and walk on